the other leadership first, but I'm, I'm going to cancel this Wednesday night's midweek, and I meant to talk with everybody, but I, you just forgive me. I've been really scattered the last few days. Uh, just a lot of stuff going, pulled in multiple directions, but the reason why is because we have quite a few out this week, and some are going on vacation just as soon as today is over, and some are leaving tomorrow and going to be gone this week, and uh, Stacy and I need to actually excuse ourselves this week, and our nephew who has been with us for the past month, we're taking him back to Oklahoma, and we're leaving Tuesday to do that, and so we'll be back Thursday night. So I just think it might be best just to cancel this week and just call it a holiday week. How's that sound? Okay, so 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 18. This is Paul the Apostle talking here, and he is writing a letter to one of his sons, and he's got some things on his heart, and I want to discuss uh, at least one of the things that he has on his heart today. We'll see how far we can get with this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes, I started to have Stacy read just verse 15 alone this morning. <laughs> verse 16, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he has often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. When Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, in 1865, they found five things in his pockets. They found a little boy's pocket knife, an embroidered handkerchief with the letter A on it, his glasses, a $5 bill, which happened to be Confederate, ironically, and then three articles from a newspaper in New York. The articles had been written about Abraham Lincoln, and the articles said he was a good man, he was a man of integrity, and he was a man who would do good for the nation. Now, from our perspective, we look back and think, of, of course he was a good man. We, we know Abraham Lincoln. We have monuments about him. We have history lessons about him and what he did for our nation. But I just need to tell you that in 1865, the jury was still out on him. Yeah. Uh, his place in history wasn't established yet. He was being criticized and attacked constantly. There were many in the nation at that time who were not sure about him. There were many others who were convinced that he was out to do evil and harm to our nation. But knowing what we know about him, we have no problem ascribing greatness to him in hindsight because hindsight's often kinder than foresight, right? It's easier. It requires less investment of trust on the front end. So in the face of constant criticism, he had to encourage himself and remind himself that he was a good man and that he was doing the right thing. So Surrounded by constant negativity, he would pull the articles from his pocket and he would constantly read them because he said he found them to be refreshing. Refreshing. So I want to talk to you about an often overlooked subject in the body of Christ and even beyond a subject, a ministry, an actual ministry, if you will, one that some point in time has impacted every one of us deeply. I want to talk to you this morning about the ministry of refreshing others. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day today. We honor all of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country, for our freedom, and they have given their lives. We thank you for the sacrifice, and we do not take that lightly. So on Memorial Day, of course, we come together and we celebrate and we have fun and we fellowship, but in our hearts, deep down in our hearts, we also remember those who have impacted us eternally, and we're grateful for that. We're grateful for you and your presence this morning. 
Holy Spirit, minister this morning effectively and efficiently through me, and don't let me get in the way of what the Father has on his heart for our group today. We ask it in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. I want to give you just a little bit of background on what's happening with Paul the Apostle at this time in his life. He is in prison, and he's waiting execution. He's been declared an enemy of the state by Rome. He's a threat to the Roman Empire because he said Jesus is Lord. Now, in that culture, to say Jesus is Lord implies that Caesar is not Lord. And that was a big no-no in the Roman Empire, anywhere in the world that Rome was ruling. They didn't take very kindly to that kind of talk. So he was arrested and he was charged as a political prisoner. So Christians are being hunted down at this time in Rome. They're being arrested. Uh, uh, Christianity was declared an official enemy of the state at this time because they wouldn't bow to the lordship of the emperor, of Caesar. And it's important to know here, in fact, fact, Nero was on the throne. If you know anything about Roman history, at this time Nero had taken the throne and he was a very twisted individual, very sick and devised devised means of torturing uh, the the cruelest, vilest ways imaginable for people to die. And his end game was always trying to get them to denounce the Lord Jesus. So he would get more and more twisted because they refused. So it's important to know that Paul, Paul wasn't some sort of superhero. When we think about him, sometimes we think about him and how much of the New Testament he penned. And we think about the miracles that were wrought, uh, you know, a simple handkerchief and just casting demons out and some of the things that he did. Uh, we, we try to sometimes put that, those, that company of people in this special category that they must have been elite. They must have had some powerful anointing that we don't have. And we think of men in the Bible days as being something special, something unique. But he was commissioned as an apostle. He did have insight. He did have incredible revelation. And he did work miracles. But that, that doesn't make him a superhero. <laughs> it doesn't mean he had some special anointing to help him fight off discouragement in his life. Are you with me? Doesn't mean he had an anointing to help him, help him not feel the stress and the pressure of the difficulties that he was facing in his life. He was an ordinary man like every one of us. He experienced pain. He had emotional pain. He had physical pain. He endured great mental anguish. By the time he writes his second letter, to the Corinthians, he says uh, in there, I am pressed beyond measure. That's a statement that he makes. So at that point, you begin to question whether or not you can even make it another day. He says, I'm pressed beyond measure. There are factions who are debating whether or not at this point they're debating whether he's even a legitimate apostle. And we don't even know about this. You know, we don't talk about this very much, but they're comparing him to the other apostles They're trying to get him to prove his worth, to prove his genuineness as an apostle of Jesus. Uh, And and so they're trying to get, because he really wasn't part of the clique. He wasn't part of the club, if you think about it. You know, they they were all together with Jesus, except Paul. (laughs) He kind of came in, he was kind of, he said he was like one born out of time, out of of season, out of time. He had an encounter with Jesus alone, then he goes to Ananias, but then he ends up alone for 14 more years. So... There's some of us who are called in glorious church services in environments and surroundings where people are all standing around and great men of God call us up and they pour oil on us and they lay hands on us and they call us and they prophesy over us and sometimes they blow on us and throw their coats on us and cast a mantle over on us. You know what I'm saying? Some of us have had that happen. But then there's others who are going the complete opposite direction with our life until we're blinded one day and knocked off the, the ass that's carrying us. <laughs> and we're, then after we have that encounter, then we're tucked away in obscurity for 14 more years. Nobody ever hears anything about him for 14 years because he's relearning everything that he thought he was solid on leading up to that point. So then when we finally come out declaring what we've seen in our alone time, what we've heard from Jesus in our alone time, people look at you and say, who are you? Where did you come from? I didn't see you at the conference getting confirmed in front of everybody. I didn't, you weren't with the original clique. You weren't part of that original club of 12. You're not one of the elite. I didn't see you up there. 
There was a time in our life where we were moving. It was a, a we were about to take on a new assignment. This is about 14 years ago, and we were a part of a, a ministry out of out of the Denton area called Glory of Zion, and it was Chuck Pierce, Prophet Chuck Pierce, Apostle Chuck Pierce. If you know who he is, big time prophet. If you don't know who he is, you don't know. But if you know, you know. <laughs> he's he's known all over the world. This is a guy who has audiences with presidents of nations and kings of and he and he flies in on the jet and gives them prophetic words and lays the course for their nation for months and years to come. So if you know who he is, you know who he is. He's a big guy. Well, we were part of his organization and we were to be confirmed. We and so we were, we went down there for a week and we were there for all of the festivities and they're having an ordination service at the front and Stacy's like, uh, okay, you know, are you sure you don't want to go? And I said, no, you're coming up with me. We're going to go up here together. We go up to the front and Chuck Pierce and Dutch Sheets and uh, Robert Heidler and uh, C. Peter Wagner, all of these guys who are names in the kingdom, they're all walking across the front of the church pouring oil on people. And they're all passing the microphone back and forth, prophesying to them. It's powerful words. And I'm like, all right, you know, we're, we're about to get confirmed publicly by the prophet of God right here in front of everybody that this assignment is God, that we're supposed to be going where we're going, doing what we're doing at the time that we're doing it. So we're standing there and, we're, and we, we, we decide to get spiritual. So we lift our hands and we're worshiping and we close our eyes and... They're coming through here praying for everybody, and they're pouring oil on them and prophesying to everyone. And all of a sudden, it was just almost our turn, and I noticed no hands got laid on us. Nothing was happening. Nothing was being said. And so I just keep worshiping and praying in the Spirit. I finally cracked my eyes open after a few minutes, and a group of Vietnamese ministers had rushed up there and crowded in front of us. And so they all got prayed for, and then the whole ministry team was already like well past us now. They were 10 people past us. So nobody even saw us. And so I was like, inside I was like, no, wait a second, you know. We're supposed to get a word from God here. We're supposed to have the horn of oil poured over our head. The prophet himself is supposed to declare a word over us. So, you know, so I'm squeezing her hand, and we're like fighting back frustration, you know. I'm like, who are these people they think they are that just come up here and jump in front of us? when it's our time to shine and our time to get prayed for. And so I, I just close my eyes and I, I finally just start repenting of my attitude. And I was like, all right, God, I know your voice. You've been talking to me since I was 12. You know, I, one thing I do know, I've messed up in life. I've made some mistakes in life, but I do know his voice. I do know when he's talking to me. So I was like, okay, I'm over myself now. I know your voice. I know you're sending me. So I'm just praying with my eyes shut. And all of a sudden I hear a woman talking to me that's not my wife I open my eyes and uh, and Linda Heidler who's Robert Heidler Pastor Robert Heidler's wife had come up and stood right between me and Stacy and she leaned in and started praying over us and I don't know if she saw what had happened or not I don't, I don't have a clue but she was led by the Holy Spirit because she began to release a powerful prophetic word over us just quietly no spotlights, no horn of oil being poured on us or anything like that. But she's whispering this powerful prophetic word. And she says, now's the time. Shawnee is the place and you are the man. You are going there not because somebody invited you, but because God is sending you. And, so she, and then she began to talk about with great details things that had been happening in that region. She was very specific for 27 years and God is sending you to break some things off region and to cast a mold for, for the future moving forward. And so it was, it was a very powerful experience, but it wasn't quite what I thought it would. Well, that's what's happening with Paul here. He wasn't one of the cluck, click or club, or he wasn't one of the original 12. Nobody really knew who he was. He was being challenged. He was being questioned. They wanted to know who is this guy. Prove, can you prove yourself? Is there any way you can prove you had this vision? Was there anybody there when you had these visions, Paul? How is it that you know what you know? And so listen to what he says when, he's at, when, when they're wanting him to confirm himself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22, he says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if I'm out of my mind, but I'm more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, 
beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep that's floating in the ocean, in case you're wondering. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure on me of concern for all of the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? So Paul's basically saying, if, if you've ever been through anything, I can relate because I've been through it too. I've probably been through it even more than you have. Not only has he experienced pain and mental anguish, but he's experienced anguish over things that he cannot control, things that are completely out of his control. Now, it's one thing to stress over the things that we have the power to control or the power to fix, but it's something entirely different to be consumed with things that are out of our control. He suffered rejection and abandonment. He was forsaken by those closest to him, those who he had helped the most, had forsaken him. If he hadn't been stressed out, pressed beyond measure, walked through tribulation, walked through disappointment, he probably didn't have anything to say. But he was, so he does. He has a lot to say, amen? Amen. He understood isolation. He understood being abandoned by people he, who he had poured his life into. So when he writes to Timothy to encourage him, he's not, he's not just sharing Timothy with Timothy something that he heard somewhere or something that he read somewhere or something that the latest conference was preaching. He's talking to Timothy from the depths of his heart about the struggles of life and the adversity of life. He's sharing life experience. So that's why the people that I'll give voice to the quickest are the ones who have been before me and they've experienced the pain of life and the pain of ministry. And they can, the reason why I have tremendous respect and when they start speaking, I lean in and I stop talking to hear what they have to say because they've been before me and they can offer some advice that will help me navigate the waters with a wisdom that is just anointed with experience. And that means something to me. So I'm not interested at this phase in my life in cute Christian catchphrases or vague prophecies from people who have never been through anything. You know what I'm talking about. You've heard them too. You've seen them too. I need people in my life who can help me find my way to the heart of the Father in the midst of my pain. In the midst of my pain. So Paul's writing to Timothy as one who knows how to stay bold and maintain your faith when everything seems to be going wrong. One of the greatest blessings that God can give you is someone to refresh and encourage you in the difficulties of life. It's an incredible blessing when God sends someone to me at the lowest points of my life to minister and to encourage. However, what's even better than that is when God uses you to be the encourager in someone else's life. One of the greatest gifts God can use you to be to another person is one who refreshes and encourages them in their spirit when they're having a tough time in life. And in case you're forgetting, we're not talking about Paul today. We're talking about Onesiphorus. He's the guy who Paul says, oft refreshed me. Often refreshed me. Onesiphorus, his name itself means one who brings help or brings profit. So the implication is when they show up, they're going to be beneficial in some way just by simply being there. That was his identity. That was his name. To be refreshed means a breath of fresh air, to cool off from being overheated, to revive again. So Onesiphorus is a guy who's only mentioned in Scripture twice. There's no mention of a great sermon. There's no mention of a powerful prophecy, a deep prayer, no insightful revelation, no miracles worked. He's mentioned because he was willing to bring somebody a breath of fresh air when they needed it the most. The ministry of refreshing others was how the Holy Spirit saw fit to allow us to identify and remember this man moving forward. In the most difficult days of Paul's life, he showed up, he encouraged him, and Paul found his presence to be refreshing. So we don't always do a good job of filling in the blanks in hindsight, but just consider the possibilities of a a man like Paul who endured all of the things that he did. 
he may not have been able to pin all the letters to the churches that he did had it not been for the presence of a refreshing encourager in his life. I mean, you, you heard the man's pedigree. <laughs> his, he's bearing the marks of an apostle, shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, stripes laid on my back, spent more time in prison than out of prison. I mean, he's going through a difficult season in this phase of his life with just one challenge after another, one adversity after another. But the Lord sent a refreshing encourager to him, and he saw fit to mention him to Timothy. So Proverbs 25, 13 says this, like an ice cold drink at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger to the one who sends him. He refreshes the spirit of his master. Verse 14, in contrast to, to, to the other verse, says, like clouds and wind without rain is one who boasts of, of gifts never given. <clears throat> so think about the contrast between the two. So the churches who broker in hope will lead in this generation and they'll capture the heart of cities. There's been a massive shift in how church has done in the last two years. And that shift is not over. There is a, there is a, a global reformation taking place in what we call church and how we do church in the direction that the church is moving forward. There are a lot of questions. I don't have all the answers to every one of those questions, but this one thing I know, the churches who broker in hope will lead in this next generation and they'll capture the heart of their region and their city. So if Life Center will, I believe with all of my heart, will stay committed to a message of hope in delivering refreshment and encouragement, then this city will eventually notice that. People will notice that and they'll perk up. I want to give you three characteristics of a refresher. I know you're ready to eat and so am I. <laughs> Let me give you three characteristics of a refresher and then we'll do that. Number one, refreshers are willing to search out those in need. In verse 17, while most people are trying to get out of Rome and away from Paul because of the problematic circumstances of being a Christian in a hostile environment, and associating with him a prisoner and enemy of the state, a political prisoner at that. Everybody is cutting ties and running and leaving Rome, but Onesiphorus goes into Rome and searches Paul out. So I already said Nero was the one who was on the throne. He was persecuting Christians in unimaginable ways. Everybody's leaving and vacating, but Onesiphorus runs into Rome to find Paul. So if I'm going to be a refresher and I'm going to seek out people in need, I'm going to have to learn to live my life by conviction, not convenience. <clears throat> Can I tell you the difference? The desire to be a refresher of others is not born of convenience, but it's born of conviction. It's never convenient to get involved in somebody else's life, especially when it's chaotic. It's never going to be convenient. Convenience says, if you need me, call me. Conviction says, I know you're hurting and I'm on the way. Convenience says, I need to have my needs met, and then if I can, I'll get to your needs. Conviction says, I trust God that if I bless you and help you, he'll take care of me because of that. Proverbs 11:25 says, the generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. So conviction that my life is about others before myself is a lifestyle of selfless serving, selfless living. Conviction that will move us to go against the public opinion because the public opinion it was church folks that didn't want to be seen with Paul at that time nobody wanted anything to do with him because of the high cost it was against the law to be an enemy of the state so when others turned away Onesiphorus found his way to Paul he refreshed him now my question is how did he refresh him how did he refresh him did he take him to a conference did he give him a word from God you know did he did he say I'm going to add you to my prayer list Paul rest assured I'm going to be praying for you every day Paul he refreshed him by showing up, just showing up. It gives worth and value to people when you take the time to show up and come alongside them in difficult times in their life. There's no record, really, that he said a whole lot to Paul. If, it's, if, if the conversations were, were deep, they weren't recorded or written anywhere for us. We don't have access to them. He just took care of them, his presence. He just came and sat with them. In fact, if you remember... Job's friends who came to comfort him, they sat with him for seven days and everything was fine, but then they all started talking and they got into trouble pretty quick when they started talking. As long as they were just sitting with him, everything was fine. 
Number two, refreshers are never detoured by the circumstances of those in need. Verse 16, he says, he was not ashamed of my chains. So he didn't show up and attempt to be super spiritual with Paul. He didn't show up and say, Paul, if you had more faith, God would open this prison door and you could go free. You know, Peter was in prison. The Lord sent an angel and shook, shook the doors loose. Are you sure you're praying enough, Paul? You see, that's what I'm talking about, those cute Christian phrases <laughs> and those vague prophecies. You know, before when you and Silas were locked up, you started praising and the, and the prison shook. Are you sure you're praising enough, Paul? Is your confession right, Paul? I don't think that's how he refreshed him at all. And you know, you don't have to go in and sit with somebody and feel a need to give them false hope. It's not about giving them false hope. It's just being willing to sit with them and be available for them, available to them, to encourage them, to uphold them, just to spend time with them. Sometimes just spending time with them says everything that needs to be said. The worst thing we can do is run to them and try to give them false hope. Uh, by manufacturing a prophetic word or manufacturing some direction for them if you'll do this or if you'll do that. Because when we do that, we double down the difficulty that they're already facing in their life with, when we try to manufacture something or predict how things are going to turn out. I tell you, when people are going through stuff, one of, the, one of the things when I was a young minister that was the most tempting for me was to tell them, if you will do this, then God will do this, or life will turn out better if you will do this. But I just realized that sometimes you just have to shut up and just take them by the hand and make the journey with them. Because sometimes you can't make every prediction in life, and you can't always prophesy how this thing is going to turn out. And the truth of the matter is, sometimes it doesn't turn out the way anybody wanted it to. And there are just some questions we'll not have answers to on this side of life. And I'm telling you, it's one of the one of the biggest burdens lifted off of me 10 years ago as a pastor was when I let go of the need to try to answer every question that came my way and have answers for everyone. You're like, wait a minute, Mark, you don't have answers? <laughs> I have answers, but I just may not have the answer you're looking for. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to every question, and there are things I'm still walking through and trying to figure out myself. It doesn't matter how many doctorates you have or degrees you have, how deep your revelation of the word is, there's going to be seasons and circumstances in our lives that we're not always going to have clarity in. There are some seasons we're just not going to know what to do next. We're just not going to know. <laughs> Amen. So you have to come to a level of trust in your life where you can say, I'm not sure what I believe, but like Paul, I'm convinced in whom I believe. And I know that he is faithful to keep what I've committed to him against that day. So it's one thing for ministers to travel through and to preach their insight and their revelation and their, on faith. And then they move on down the road on Monday and, and, and don't even think about you again. They're preaching the truth. What they're saying is the truth. But they don't have to stick around and answer the questions. So they can come through and preach the truth and preach revelation. But then they're gone you need somebody that will walk through your life with you and not necessarily answer every question, but just hold your hand and make the journey with you. Amen? So it's, it's people who are called the pastor who usually end up having to sit by the bedsides of people when everything is not working out right and everything's not going the way you want, and you have to sit with them, and, and you have to do your best to help answer the questions because the questions are going to come. I mean, the questions are going to come. They're going to come rapid fire sometimes. Questions will always come, and we'll always have questions. And I do know some answers, but I don't know all of them. But I will set with you, though, and I will minister to you, and I will encourage you, and I will just take you to the Lord. Amen? In moments like that, it's really tempting to want to try and say all the right things, but... They really don't need to always hear all of that. Sometimes they just need to be refreshed. They just need to be encouraged. They need someone who's not afraid to show up and sit with them through the process. So, so we need to, number one, avoid being super spiritual. Number two, avoid giving false hope. So Anisiphorus, he doesn't come in with gloom either. He doesn't come in and, and sit in a pity party. He doesn't say, I feel sorry for you. You don't deserve this. After, after all, you're Paul. You know, we're, we've read your letters. We know we've seen you do miracles. He doesn't come in with gloom, but he doesn't come in with embarrassment either. He doesn't say, well, Paul, 
what you're doing right now, where you're suffering right now, I know you don't deserve this, but it's, it's, you're kind of embarrassing the church, you know, because of what's going on in your life right now. So that's why everyone's distancing themselves from you. He was, Paul made it a point to say he was not ashamed of my chains. I, I, I find that interesting. That's an interesting statement. You can never be a real friend to anyone that you cannot bear their reproach because you're too ashamed of their problem. You can never be a real friend to someone who you're ashamed of their, their problem. We were in a mentorship session years ago. Bishop Miller was talking with a group of ministers and he was telling us about a time in some ministers' lives where three pastors that he knew that were in alignment with him and were close friends, and he had, he had been like a spiritual father to all three of them. He said all three of them were going through terrible crisis moments in their lives and in their ministries. One was going through a very public divorce. One of them overdosed on prescription meds, had a car wreck while he was under the influence of prescription meds, and he severely maimed an individual that he hit. And so in that state, it carried an automatic prison sentence. <laughs> the other one had a moral failure with someone who worked for him. And so when he wouldn't leave his wife for this woman, she filed sexual harassment charges on him. That also carried a prison sentence in the state in which he pastored in. So all of a sudden, these guys are going through very public crisis moments. And when you see that begin to happen, people begin to distance themselves immediately <laughs> because they're ashamed of the chains, right? <laughs> and so they begin to distance themselves. And so these men of God, though, I want to make it plain here, they weren't suffering for the gospel. They were suffering because of consequences of their decisions, okay? But Bishop said this. He said, instead of being ashamed of them, ashamed of their reproach, I chose to stand with them in this season of their life. He said, I wrote them, the ones that went to prison, I wrote them, I stayed in touch with them, I ministered to their family, I checked in on their family, our organization helped their family, we helped them in any way that we could, we prayed with them, we wrote to them, we, we, we came alongside of them, we rejoiced with them, when each one of them recovered and were restored, we came and we celebrated with them, we helped them restore. And he said, the Bible says a friend loves at all times, not just in the good times, Right? So Anisiphorus is not put off by the circumstances here. So if you've never failed before in your life, go ahead and keep throwing rocks at the people who do. But there are people who have hit rock bottom in their life before. And we're not going to do them any good or we're not going to do them any justice. And we're never going to be established as a refreshing encourager in life if we're ashamed of people's chains. If we're ashamed of their bondages. My, my, my dad was pastoring in a town in Oklahoma and he was establishing himself in that town and, and the other ministers in town knew him and uh, there was a minister and I, I have to be very vague with the details but there was a minister who had been caught in a public scandal and his board two of his board two of the board it was a prestigious church in town long history rich history and the church was four or five times the size of this church, the structure and this gymnasium and everything else and just incredible facility, long, rich legacy there in the community. And, uh, but, however, the church had been dying off because the church had been aging out, so there weren't very many people left in it. Well, this guy had come, and he had served faithfully for 10 years up to this point, and things had turned around, and the church was packed out, and it was exploding with new life and vision. The church was going somewhere special, was making a splash in the town again, and then all of a sudden this pastor has a public scandal. That wasn't massively public. It was like second, third page, small article in the Oklahoma City newspaper, but it was public. It was definitely public in the small town that he pastored in. And so two of the board members called my dad because they knew him, they were friends, and, 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 and they had a relationship, and they said, we're about to have a meeting this afternoon to discuss what steps we're going to take with this pastor moving forward. But he said, uh, I know the board is leaning towards completely giving him the axe and just cutting him off and moving on. And he said, I, but I, I wanted to know if you would come talk to them 
because I know you're a man of wisdom and I know you're a man of compassion and a man of mercy. And so my dad went out and he talked to this board and they said, preacher, what would you do? And he said, I'm just, I can't tell you what I would do because it's not me in the situation. But he said, I will tell you something to consider. He said, there's not a person here without sin in their life. And he said, even Jesus, when he caught somebody, he said, he that is with, when they caught somebody and drug her to the feet of Jesus, wrapped in the sheets of adultery, he said, he that is without sin, cast the first stone. And everybody dropped their rocks. And my dad sat there with that board that day, and he said, I will tell you something to consider. If you give mercy to this man, well, he said, first of all, what's the man's heart and state of mind? And they said, he's broken. He's disgraced. He's completely broken. He stood up and cried and poured his heart out to the entire church, confessed his problem, which was pornography-based, asked everyone to forgive him, begged for their forgiveness and their mercy, and he's done the same thing with the board, and Dad said, so he's repentant, he's humble, and they said, of course he is, he's been caught, he's disgraced, and they said, yeah, but that's beside the point, he's humble, he's broken, he's at a place right now where this next decision could make all the difference in his life, and he said, I tell you, want something to consider, if you were to give this man mercy, and all of you were to come around him and love him, grab him and give him a hug, pray over him and restore him, you would probably have the best pastor you've ever had, had in your life, and he would probably stick with you for the rest of his life. And they said, thank you for your advice, Pastor Wallace. You can go now. So he left, and they voted, and they fired him that afternoon. And they cut the strings, and they moved on. You know why? They called him the next day, the one guy, and he said, th he said thank you for coming and talking, Fred. I appreciate it. It really means a lot. But he said, at the end of the day, we could not bear the reproach of the shame he had brought on our church. They could not handle the weight of the man's chains. Now, <laughs> it's somber right now. And listen, there's nothing going on in my life, so nobody be afraid, okay? <laughs> I'm not setting a stage here. I'm just telling you. I'm just speaking from my heart, and I'm giving you examples of what it truly means to be a refresher and an encourager. Because who among us is without sin? Amen. Who among us has not, who, who here is not human, by the way? Every one of us are human, and we're all going to find ourselves in situations and circumstances that were either the, the device of our own making, we either made it happen by our own decisions, or just the cruelty of life, just the randomness of life itself. Just going through the wrong intersection at the wrong time and getting T-boned can change your life forever. It wasn't an accident. I mean, it wasn't anything that you did to deserve that. It's just an accident that happens. Things like that happen in our lives, right? Number three. Number three, refreshers are the grace-filled presence of the Holy Spirit operating through human vessels. Refreshers are the grace-filled presence of the Holy Spirit operating through human vessels. Psalm 23 and 5, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. The result of that is my cup overflows. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of refreshing. John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water, refreshing water. This spake he of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 7 and 5 in the Amplified Bible Paul is talking here, he says, For even when we arrived in Macedonia, our bodies had no ease or rest, but we were oppressed in every way and afflicted at every turn, fighting and contentions without dread and fears within. Let me give you a little background of what's happening here. So this is Paul describing his own state when he arrives in Macedonia. He says, My body had no ease, no rest, we were oppressed in every way. We were afflicted at every turn. I have fighting and contention without, and then within I have dread and fear. What's happening in Paul's life here, you just have to dig to find out. Paul had sent a letter to the church in Corinth because there was a man in the church who was living in immorality. He was living in incest, to be precise. The man would not respond to the elders of the church, so they asked Paul, what should we do? So he, they, they asked him to repent. He wouldn't repent. So Paul tells them, put him out of the church 
In fact, he told them this. He said, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that he may be saved in the end. Now, you can, you can figure out the theology of that another time, but it might just, just give you something to consider. It might be as, as simple as put him back under the accusation of the law because Jesus himself said in another place that the Jewish system was the synagogue of Satan. Yes, sir. But anyway, that doesn't matter right now for the sake of argument today, just something for your consideration. So when he didn't hear back from the Corinthian church after sending those strong words, he became intensely concerned that the church he birthed was offended with him over the letter he wrote. So as he travels to a few places, he's watching and he's waiting for news from his friends He's travailing, he's hurting inside over the thought of them being angry with him. But then verse 5 reads this, the, the, verse five, 5 says that fears within him was causing dread. But then Titus shows up, young Titus shows up in verse 6, but God who comforts and encourages and refreshes and cheers the depressed and the sinking, comforted and encouraged and refreshed and cheered us by the arrival of Titus. Do you know what Titus said? <laughs> the church at Corinth sends their love. <laughs> I mean, he's a spiritual father who thought the relationship had been severed because some time had gone by here and they had not responded. And so he's carrying the pain and the agony of have they severed the tie. And then Titus shows up and says, the church at Corinth sends their love. By the way, they also said to tell did what you said with that guy. And in the end, he finally repented and he's been restored again. Not an angel, but by a person named Titus who came with refreshing news. <sighs> you ready for this statement? Stop praying for God to manifest himself supernaturally in a person's life and become the manifestation of God to them. Amen. When people are hurting, they don't need us to pray with them that God shows up. They need us to show up as God. They need us to take them by the hand and pay a bill for them, buy a meal for them, gas up their truck for them. Amen. Especially right now. My gosh, I stopped the other day to gas my truck up and the pump finally shut off at $125 and it wasn't even full. Yeah. That's just the limit on my card kicked in and just shut the pump down. I mean, there's people right now who are struggling to gas vehicles up. Yeah. There are people who are hurting. They don't need us to take them by the hand and say, I pray in the name of Jesus that God meets every need you have according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. They need us to meet a need that they have. They need us to feed them, to clothe them, to set with them, to pray with them, but then follow through with the prayer by taking action. Amen? I, what I want to see is I want to see this place established. I know you're there in your hearts already. I already know that. I want this place established within Indianapolis as a, as a place of, of refreshing and encouragement, a place that is known for good news, a place that brokers hope to a city that needs hope. Every morning we turn our news on and there's been a shooting somewhere else in the city the night before. We must broker in hope and we must tell people there is a better way to live. There is a better way and his name is Jesus Christ. I want to be a minister who carries a refreshing drink of water everywhere that I go. And I want to see the people in our church family become refreshers and encouragers in the community. So we don't really need this massive seven point church growth plan. We just need to serve our city. We just need to serve our city. There was a minister friend of mine by the name of David Shibley, and he's, he's, he's still alive. I don't mean to say that in the past tense. Incredible man of God. He said this, and I wanted to share it with you. May people be in heaven because you lived. May companies, even countries, be transformed because you live. May the Great Commission be much closer to the Great Completion because you lived. At the end, when you transition from time to eternity, may you have a legacy of genuine success, a life lived beyond the bottom line. The baseline that ultimately matters isn't at the end of your ledger, it's at the end of your life. May others have found your presence to be refreshing. Amen. Andrew. <clears throat> I don't know who said this, but I heard a minister say it, and he, had, and, and he was quoting somebody, but I couldn't find who he was quoting. But he said, the church is not a museum for the saints, it's a hospital for the broken. Not a museum for the saints, it's a hospital for the broken. So if it is a hospital for the broken, and I agree with the statement, and you're all shaking your heads, so I take it you agree with it as well. 
then we shouldn't be too surprised when the broken show up. And they're very broken. <laughs> right? Because broken people are broken. And we've been there before as well in our lives. <clears throat> I want to give you a little bit of history behind this message. This message I preached was a message the, the first time I ever heard it was a man named Bishop Tony Miller preached it. And uh, a few weeks later, I was sitting having breakfast with him. And he and I told him, I said, my God, that message impacted me. And I've never heard anybody preach an entire message on Onesiphorus. And I said, do you mind if I preach that somewhere sometime down the road, a few years down the road? And he said, I would be honored if you would. And he said, I'll go back home tonight and I'll send you my notes. And he did. He sent his notes to me. And I said, Bishop, I will always give you credit for it. This is the first time I've ever preached it in its entirety. And he grabbed me by the hand and he said, Mark, I'm past the point in my life of needing credit for anything. Did you hear that? I'm past the point of my life of needing credit for anything. This man had preached in coliseums around the world where they were packed out from 50 to 300,000 people. He had seen the dead raised. He had seen miracles everywhere. He had traveled the world preaching in, I don't know how many countries all over this planet, seeing mighty miracles and people come out, crusades just packed out. He said there was, there was a crusade in Haiti one time, and there was a woman that, that he said miracles were happening in the crusade every night. And he said a woman had been coming every night. Well, her, her baby had died that day and she went to the hospital but he died at the hospital the doctor confirmed the baby dead confirmed signed the death certificate the woman refused he said if you'll leave your baby with us we'll take care of it she refused she said no i'm not giving up that easy she said there's a healing crusade in town tonight and i'm going to go to it and i'm going to take my baby and he said ma'am your baby is dead now it's it's beyond healing and she said i'm not giving up that night she went to the crusade, but there were over 300,000 people there packed in up around the stage. She had the baby in a, in a papoose type thing, wearing, wearing it up against her, and she couldn't get to the stage that night, so she went home. The next night she came back a second night, couldn't get to the stage again. On the third night, she finally got to the stage, and when they were praying over her, they didn't, Bishop said, I had no idea what was wrong with the baby. I just thought the baby was sick. But he said, I laid hands on the baby and the baby's limbs started moving. They had been stiff by this point. The baby's limbs started moving and the baby started screaming and crying and everyone around the woman immediately started screaming. People were passing out, falling out. And he said, I didn't know what was happening. I just kept praying. And he said, later, the pastor at the crusade brought the doctor up on stage that had confirmed that baby dead three days earlier. And the doctor said, I don't know what I just saw tonight, but this can only be God. This can only be God. I'm telling you that to say this. Bishop Tony said that at the end of that crusade, he was in his hotel room one night, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, this season of your life is over. This season of your life is over now. From now on, I want you to spend the rest of the time just mentoring men and women. Mentoring men and women. So he went from a season where he was preaching at Colosseums with 300,000 people to 50,000 people, you know. As a matter of fact, in Fiji once, he said there were over a, mil a million people at a meeting that they were preaching at in Fiji. He went from that season to a season where that day he was sitting in a room with 10 of us men and he bring his heart out to us. And he was content. He was happy because he said, my only goal is to share, share the heart of the Father, to just pour into other people's lives and mentor them. So he said, when I look around and I see pastors committing suicide, pastors having moral failures, pastors giving up, walking away from their dreams and their visions, it breaks my heart. So he said, in this next season of my life, I just want to serve men and women. I want to spend time with them in rooms like this, and I want to minister to them. And I want to refresh them and encourage them. And I, I did that today. I shared this word today because the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I haven't thought about it. This sermon has been archived in my computer for five years now. 
Friday morning, I woke up from a powerful dream, and the Lord said, pull that message out and preach it, because I'm going to make that part of the DNA of the Life Center. Pull that message out and preach it. So I pulled it out, and I shared it with you today, and I shared the rest of the details, because I want you to know it is possible to have that type of an impact on a person with just one encounter. One encounter, maybe at a gas pump, in a drive through line, you know, on a job site somewhere. God wants to use you to be a refreshment, to be an encouragement. Stand up and I want to pray with you real quick and then we have a testimony that we want to share with you this morning as well before we dismiss. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. Holy Spirit, 